perfect. Um, I would now like to welcome you once again to the lecture series, The Critical Gaze, Reflection on Global Crises in Portuguese Language Comics at the University of Cologne. My name is Yannick Scholz. I'm a research assistant at the Portuguese Brazilian Institute of the University of Cologne, and I'm pleased to introduce today's guest, Maria Paula Menezes. Maria Paula Menezes is a principal researcher at the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra in Portugal. Um, a Mozambican scholar, she obtained her master in history in Russia and her PhD in the USA by Rutgers University. Um, her research focus is on the political history and social legal complexity of Southern Africa, especially Mozambique, Angola and South Africa. At the heart of her interests are the relations between knowledge, power and societies, paying special attention on um, people who, who experienced the violence of the colonial encounter. She has conducted various projects on the post-colonial legal pluralism with a focus on the relationship between the state and traditional authorities, the relationship between official history, memory and memories, and other narratives of belonging in contemporary identity struggles. And her works have been published in journals, in books, and reports um, all over the world, actually, uh, in states like Mozambique, Spain, Portugal, Senegal, um, the United States, England, Germany, Colombia, and others. And I would like to uh, guide your attention to one text she published on today's topic, actually. If you're able to read Portuguese, then I warmly recommend this article, which is called Chikonyoka o Inimigo, Narrativas de Violência sobre a Construção da Nação em Mozambique. And it's available for free online. Uh, maybe I can put the link to this article in the chat afterwards. So, Maria Paula, we are really happy to have you. Thanks for joining us with your expertise on Mozambique. And the stage is yours, so to speak. Uh, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. I really thank uh, Yannick for digging me up from the internet and finding uh, a topic that I'll be talking to you about that's also part of my personal trajectory as a Mozambican. So I remember the times of Shikunyoka. But in order to help structuring my presentation, and I think uh, from the conversation that I had very very well with Peter and Yannick um, about the work that you guys are doing at the Institute. I try to organize it through a lot of uh, uh, slides in a PowerPoint presentation for you to have a glimpse of what I'm talking about, about images and how we use images and the, how important the images are still are. I could go on for hours because really the visual it's very important, but if you don't mind, I will start with the, I will start sharing the screen if I find the presentation, which is here. And are you seeing it? And let me put it up. So Shikunyoka, the enemy, I changed slightly the title of the presentation because I think that whenever we start working, we'll shape our it's a kind of strange to give titles for things that we only prepare four or five days before. So I changed slightly. This is one of the key figures of Shikunyoka. Uh, but indeed the figure, this cartoon shaped the political landscape of Mozambique. And in that sense, I think they are very important for us to study. So on situatedness, uh, why to study the Shikunyoka into the paper that uh, Yannick made reference. This is a cartoon that embodies the evils of the Mozambican revolution. Uh, and to study it was, became for me almost a personal task, part of my historical trajectory as a Mozambican. It resulted both from my own experience in Mozambique. I was born in Mozambique as a colonial province and uh, I witness the transition to independence. So that's just to make a big bracket. It's kind of interesting to have witnesses the end of two empires, the Portuguese colonial empire and the end of the Soviet empire. And we could talk about it in another, but those are things that 
shape your life and make you think about the, what is worth or not in the way we address political questions. So I still remember how common it was when we were students and we were young to accuse someone of being a chikunyoka or even to use the verb chikunyokar and that's the, the ones that know Portuguese know how easy it is to transform a word in a verb to describe the performity of an action perceived to be reactionary. In short, Chikunyoka, as I will try to discuss with you here, embodies the antithesis of the new man, the upright and progressive citizen that was supposed to be the figure to construct the socialist Mozambique. Uh, the analysis I'll be sharing with you build on a long uh, involvement as an academic and activist concerning the role of public history in society, in constructing Mozambique, and in understanding the ways in which history and associated representation, such as the cartoons, comics, and so on, can sustain social change or reinforce systems of social and political control. And this part for me is particularly relevant, as I think that, as Yane kindly mentioned, my, uh, my training, my academic training, uh, was in my academic training, it was very interesting to, for me now that I look back at it, to, to understand the various moments of cognitive injustice when we have to, I had to face both in US or in Russia, the prejudices regarding African contributions to world history. So these are the questions that we need to, ad to address today. And I think in that sense that the key question in Europe, where I currently work, has to deal with the representation of Europe in the world, recognizing that what is usually described as a global world and global history are indeed a part of history, as I try to address, because the world is composed of multiple epistemic provinces entailing multiple situated histories, whose narratives quite often are conflictual, and I will also try to address that question. So we need to recognize that the cultural and historical diversity of the world is incommensurable, and that's why it's so important to be here sharing ideas about how do we represent the world. So I'll go, my key uh, topics that I'll be to address is the inspiration for the figure of Chikunyoka, the importance of cartoons and comics in reconstructing alternative historical narratives. To address briefly the question of Mozambican revolution, this is for me, it's a core element because we only understand revolutions if they are shaped according to the key Eurocentric transformations that are led by the labor class and the labor, we mean workers, and there's a whole model of a revolution means. Whereas if you really go to the core of the world, a revolution is a radical change of the nature of power. And I think we need to address Mozambique, that period, as a revolutionary process with its all implications. And to look in that sense, Chikunyaka is the anti-hero, the ethics that helps us teaching the ethics of the, revolution, of the revolution and its pitfalls, and also, finally, the role of art in, re in rescuing other political alternatives. In that sense, political cartoons, I think, function as key indicators of the democratic health of a political project. On the one hand, they represent a form of propaganda. On the other, they can function as a sort of critique or even a satire. They offer the opportunity to present complex relationships concisely and forcefully or to trigger emotional responses from the audience. And these images provide individual momentary insights into the expression and experiences of power and the creative ways in which they are responded to. That's the importance of exploring here the political cartoons of the Chikunyoka that are an inspiration to decolonize knowledge, to decolonize history, and to raise questions about power, resistance, and representation. Chikunyaka is a figure that emerged in Mozambique quite soon after the independence. The country became independent in the aftermath of a liberation war in 1975. Uh, and when uh, uh, the, the, the leading figure in the opposing Portuguese colonialism, one the main leading figure was Frelimo, a Mozambican liberation front, and they came to power and opted for a socialist path. And socialism was in that sense, 
the combination of the mega Marxist uh, structuring with the local components, African roots, which is another topic to, the, to be discussed in another session, but it, it's important to think about the African options, socialist options that occurred both in Senegal, in, in, in the Congos, in Mali, uh, in Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, in Angola, in Tanzania, and, and Guinea Conakry. So it's useful to go back to it, not as local project, but part of a broad socialist project that sought to embody the mega global reflection about the evils of capitalism and colonialism with the, the local contributions. And it's never too much to remember in 1945, the cry of Juan Krumah in the Manchester 5th Pan-African Conference, colonizers, colonized of the world unite. So that became the key, one of the key questions of the 20th century. But challenging the legacy of the violent colonial past, as I will be addressing briefly soon, uh, the young nation of Mozambique faced many problems, economic, political, internal ones, as well as the hostility of the neighbors that were the embodiment of the continuation of capitalism colonial relationship in the, in the face of uh, then Southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and apartheid South Africa, both ruled by white regimes. In this context emerged this cartoon, Shipnyoka, which was first present in 1976 by the Department of Information and Propaganda of Relimo in magazine Tempo. And Shipnyoka was the paradigm of the enemy, the enemy that lived inside all of us, representing everything that the new state opposed. The name of Shipnyoka is a portmanteau from Chico, it's the short name of Francisco, Ugly Chico, that was the name of a, a, a secret police colonial agent in Mozambique. Don't ask me how I got, well, these are uh, archive pictures. So we have the picture of Chico Nyoka on the right uh, of Chico Langa, uh, the source of inspiration. And you have on the left, uh, the figure of Chico Nyoka. So it's the, the conjunction of Chico, the short name for Francisco and Nyoka that is uh, the reference to a snake, and snake is the, the symbol of someone that you don't trust. So Chicunhoca is the Francisco uh, we don't trust. So these are the evils. And if you look carefully at, at the images, you'll see that really the source of inspiration was Francisco Langa. He was killed later on. Uh, the cartoon really is a collective work. It was inspired by a group of people, among them José Freire, Worme, uh, João Craveirinha, Augustinho Milhafre, among others. Physically, if you pay attention, he has big eyes, a big head, big nose, big lips. He has fat arms and a large belly. And this the satirization and criticisms of colonial capitalist, patriarchal and traditional customs, behaviors and values that still remained impregnated in the Mozambican society after the former colonial presence of Portugal in Mozambique ended. And as I said, since 1976 and more or less until 1990s, we would see figures of Chicunhoca in the nation, in the newspapers, magazines, bulletin boards, posters, wall paintings uh, in rural and urban contexts. So it's a very good example of popular understanding and the challenge to popular understanding to power relations on a multiple scales, being it local, uh, regional, and between the state and society. So this is the question of Shipnyoka, the enemy. And this sets the question to discuss the importance of rescuing other hist historical narratives. As Michel Ralph Truyot or Suleiman Bashir Diagne have highlighted, evidences against the universally shared notion of history would indicate that history in the Western world and taught in the Western university, modern universities, is merely an exercise in the way Western talk about the world and not an enterprise in discovering the foundation or coherent methods for having justified through beliefs. So the question is how to move from this partial interpretation of the world that we are always taught in modern university, that is the story of the world. So it's a, pro a project produced, permanently produced in the present 
to anticipate the future, but projected and presented as the past, to, towards world and history, making different narratives in contact, as Polan Untu, Jingungi Wati Wong, Dipesh Chakrabarti have been claiming. This is a question that you'll see very much in art. And in the top, you have a piece of Winkas Chanibar, The Scramble for Africa. I don't go into details about the problem of Berlin and the Berlin Conference in shaping contemporary project of Africa. That's why I tend to have many problems to attend conferences in Berlin, because what Berlin means for us. But at the same time, I think it's important to think about how this po historical political project has shaped the abyssal line between what the West, the Eurocentric project, thinks about the world and the other projects that are permanently presented as local, peripheral, outdated and they don't dialogue. So that's the, the co-production of representations about history are very complicated. Although I would like to call your attention that one of the key questions in Mozambican revolution is starting to address the question of the revolution. And in a document produced by the Center for African Studies of Eduardo Mondial University, the revolution meant the radical change of nature of power. And they stated in that document, it was not enough to end the Portuguese colonial system. It was necessary to radically challenge and change the nature of power, starting from a theory and a practice that did not imitate the methods and models of the enemy. The experience of independence in Africa in the 1960s had shown that only one of the symbols had been decapitated, the white power, the power of colonialists. And that the only solution was to attack the roots of the colonial capitalist system. The struggle against the colonial system had to undergo a rupture at all levels, including producing another conception of history. So that's why to think about Mozambican history as reclaiming another history, it's so import important as now in the second half of the 20th century and the way into the 21st century, I think the amplification of democracy can really only occur if epistemic decolonization is assumed as a necessary condition for a more dignified and solidarity world. So getting back to this revolutionary project, Frelim, the main nationalist movement, wagered on a radical democratic proposal where the people, represented by Frelim, should be able to choose their government, participate in it, and take part in the discussions of country affairs. This revolution option mirrors a radical revolutionary desire for change in several dimensions, although it never challenged a key one the colonial nature of the modern state. But that's besides the point it's tackled in the article that Yannick talked about. But above all, the power of them, it meant the power of them colonized to decide from their own heads the options of their future, to be agents of their history, not only independence, which is the element that normally emerges in the discussions, but independence as the right to write the history, to assume the struggle as a right to self-determination, as self-definition, which include the struggle for social justice, for land, for education, for health, for the emancipation of women, and so on and so forth. So I think we always tend to understand independence at that moment when the papers were changed and the flags were changed, and not to understand the broad, the broad picture. So I think this is not a, a situation only present in Mozambique. So I think it's important to, to carefully analyze concepts of and claimings of being part of the third world and now what we claim to be the global south is a political proposal that mirrors the struggle for self-determination and the end of the abyssal ontological and epistemic line a line that Sukarno emphasized in 1955 at the Bandung Conference separates agents and objects of history. This utopian space time of challenges against political and epistemic colonialism brings to the fore the struggles that we still know that go on, led by subordinate subaltern silence people aim to be reintroduced as subjects of their own narratives or their as political subjects. So the questions about other histories. I'm not going to be very quick into it, but because I changed notes with Yannick about comics and cartoons, 
And indeed, one of the big elements of the Mozambican revolution was to produce another history to be taught to young people in urban contexts with reintroducing new eras. So uh, I think that it's um, important to understand these times. Um, and we see here the production by João Paulo Bosch Coelho, A Capiche, A Capor, Guns and, and Slaves, Namacurra. Uh, he also wrote another one, which um, I forgot the name. But in those three books, João Paulo Bosch Coelho is a renowned uh, scholar and a renowned historian, calls the attention to the resistance struggles as a means to recombine those narratives to produce an alternative structure for, anal for analyzing the recent past of Mozambique. Unaiti, the guerrilla, it's another history that's aimed at explaining why a young man left his village to join the liberation struggle. And finally, the Gaza and the Slaves, it's a, a book that claims and tries to analyze from combining a class and um, post-colonial approach, and the book is from 1980s, to understand the, the fall of the Gaza Empire and its negotiations with imperial powers from Europe. So it's, those are very interesting uh, um, projects to analyze. So I think uh, in this context, it's important to reflect on the emergence of this new subject that are the Mozambicans, the new men and new women, and also at the same time our difficulties sometimes if you don't give this big uh, introduction to comprehend the full meaning of why is Shikunyoka the enemy. It's a figure to understand the socialist project in Mozambique. And uh, I think that uh, this problem, how to con who controls the history, controls the future, uh, is our forms of power that we really need to bear in mind. And here there's a, a small thing, a critical stance to use Shino Zashebe comments about the Lusophone world. The question of Lusophone world, it's a very problematic one. Uh, in terms, when you are analyzing Africa, we have usually we are presented as Lusophone, Anglophone or Francophone countries. The problem is that we always share this feeling that we are always following the images that the Portuguese created about our world. And this leaves outside the other histories and other representations and the other languages that are present in our countries. Just to give you an example of Mozambique, we, are, we have 33 languages. The Portuguese is the official one, but we use other ones. And it raises a, a big question why there is this imperial representation of us as Lusophone or Portuguese speaking countries, this sort of our Africa, our colonies. And I think that we need to understand that Angola has its own path. So as Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, I'm, I'm closer to Zimbabwe and South Africa than I am to Angola or Cape Verde for that time. So those are questions that I think we need in the future to, to discuss because it, it's a, a sort of imperial imagination that's still present and does not give credit to diversity of historical connections. So moving now already to the, the enemies of the revolution, why the figure of the enemy is so important. So I'll try here in the second half, and I'm already halfway through my time, uh, to analyze the importance of creating Chikunyoka as the enemy. And this is a very interesting communication strategy of Relimo to identify and denounce the enemies of the revolution. As you know, when we are talking about the war context and the war in Mozambique started in 1963 and it never ended. So let's just talk that we have brief periods of truce, but indeed the war never ended. And we continue now with the terrorist attacks in Northern Mozambique. Um, the figure of the enemy of the terrorist, that is the, the person we are fighting against, is very important to unify the nation. So we are, those who are against us are the enemy, those who are with us are the core of the nation. So those are strategies that in political science we study as fundamental to create the idea of connectedness. 
So in the narrative regarding the liberation struggles, the figure of the enemy occupies a central place in the construction of a mythical narrative regarding the emergence of modern Mozambique, where the evils are always, almost always the product of the colonial capitalist uh, presence. The nationalist war was fundamental to shape the figure of the enemy. Uh, and, and I'm trying to, yes, it's here. Uh, the, new Mozamb the new Mozambique citizen, the new man, the new woman, uh, was supposed to destroy the corrupt ideas and habits inherited from the past. I'm, cite, I'm quoting uh, the, um, one of the political proposals of Relim from this, while at the same time promoting the scientific spirit to eliminate superstition and the emergence of a national culture, liquidating the individualism and the elitism. A year before, in 72, Samora Michel would later become the president of Mozambique asserted the enemy infiltrated spies among us. He promotes tribalism, racism, individualism, ambition, elitism, ignorance, superstition, religious fanatism, and corruption. Each of these represents an enemy among us. These enemies became what Chikunyoka was about, a drunk mouth, a year of a club, hands of a hoarder and speculator, eyes of a racist, nose of a tribalist, feet of a regionalist, and feet of confusion. The Chikunyoka is this figure that represents all the evils left by the imprints of the past that Mozambican people were fighting against to construct the new society. And Chikunyaka was all the obstacles, moral, economic, political, and cultural, that we have to face. He is a parasite who refuses to work and does not cooperate in the production. He, is, he divides the people through fake news. Surprise, surprise, fake news are not something from our time. So he, he, propagate, he spreads fake news, like the figure in the middle, uh, and refuse to cooperate in the construction, construction, the new political revolutionary project, as you see in the image of to your right. The question also is the context of the revolution, and we should not forget that until quite recently, apartheid South Africa and Rhodesia were external enemies of the revolutionary Mozambique. And this means that the confrontation continued be beyond independence, when in Southern Africa, and it's the times that we used to call the hot times of the Cold War. If North Atlantic were a Cold War, in various places of the world, there were really hot water, hot, hot, hot Cold Wars. And especially you should not, never forget what happened in Angola, where some of these clashes were so important that I even studied and military academ academies in the United States. I know it because I was invited to give a lecture about something I was not very aware of. And I said, I'm not specialist, but when I was a student, it was something very relevant. Apartheid South Africa and Rhodesia supported and armed reactionary forces that struggle against revolutionary projects in Mozambique. That's of course beyond the project of this presentation, but you should never forget that Mozambique National uh, resistant that later on would become Renamo. Basically, in the beginning, had no political projects besides being against Frelimo and Frelimo project and then exposing its errors. Whether during the liberation struggle or in the construction of Mozambican nation, the identification of the enemy was a fundamental piece. And so you see here, Shikunyoka who helps the foreigners, as you see on your right, the foreign invaders of Mozambique, and should never forget that until South African general elections, we had invasions from South Africa permanently. I remember being young, seeing a Mirage flying over our heads because a, a Mirage flight was 10 minutes away from Maputo, where I lived. At the same time, if you pay close attention to the drawing in the center, here is Radio Rhodesia, the voice of Free Africa. Smith, we're talking about uh, the then Prime Minister of Rhodesia, is speaking to all Chikunyokas. But if you, think, if you look closely, there is a diploma of PID, of the former politic, uh, political police of Portugal, and the drawing of uh, Caetano, who was the last president of Min Council of Ministers of Portugal uh, before uh, the coup d'etat of April 25th. 
So this is the context why it was important to expose the continuation of the war that really continued for very long. So Chikunyoka, it's a trail of tribalism, racism, and regionalism. And you'll see some of the images are better than others because it's not very easy to take pictures from newspapers. So I apologize for some of the quality. But he's carefully, quite often carefully dressed, strolls carefully, a bottle of wine under his arm, and leaves of marijuana dropping out of his pockets. Uh, Frelim ruled the state, Frelim embodied the state, and Chikunyoka reveals here his relation against the state, against the povo, against the collective of the new men and women that were the new citizens. So throughout the specific figure, Frelim sought to expand its popular support by denouncing specific negative identity characteristics such as racism, tribalism, or regionalism, or even against mystifying ideologies that challenge Frelim's proposals, such as leftism, populism, or liberalism. In, indeed, in the first decades of independence, when it was really difficult to address questions of class uh, between rich and, we could speak about colonizers and colonized, about rich and poor, but uh, cultural differences, ethnic or racial differences, were really tricky to address, as these questions were condemned as promoters of regionalism and fracture in a country that was itself a, pro a product of fractures that were being instrumentalized by colonial powers. So that's why it was those figures were so important to denounce. At the same time, Shikunyaki is the enemy of new power structures. With the new state, it was the attempt to change the nature of the state, of the nation state. And in lots of images, you'll see Frelimo is trying to establish this new political order based on working with the people. And here, the role of bureaucrat represents technocratic attempt to control the wills and decisions of the people. So the new man uh, was always finding obstacles to promote this idea of the new forces of organizing, like the production councils, dynamizing groups, popular assemblies. And in these moments of big confusion of trying to change the nature of the state, uh, the figure of Chikunyoka became very important. And if you see closely on the bottom uh, of the figure on your left, Chikunyoka is a bureaucrat, complicates the life of the people with endless forms to fill. It's not very different from what we find everywhere now in the world, but at those times it was normal to complain about it. And one sign on his desk says, long life to wastefulness. So here we have the Chikunyok as a middle class bourgeois who despises the people and attempts to change the nature of power. Another key figure was Chikunyok, the enemy of women's emancipation, which is a, a tricky question to address. Shikunyok on the left lectures his heavily burdened wife on the evils of Moz organization of Mozambican women, OMEM, which works, which worked at those times and still today to end the exploitation of women. However, on the right, and that's why I tried to change the color of the cartoon, women of, of OMEM are chasing him out. So the emancipation of women, you should not forget, that was one of the great objectives of nationalist struggle. And one has to remember that as many women repeatedly said, they had to fight the double oppression and exploitation, the exploitation by men and by colonialism. If, and in the sense, if for Frelimo, women's liberation was a fundamental necessity of the revolution to the guarantee of its continuity and the precondition of its victory, and I'm citing a discourse of Samara Michel of 1973, an important part of Mozambican society, even inside Frelimo, defended a secondary place, traditionally legitimate for the women, a position that Chikunyoka is a good example in this picture. So it's a critical stance between the morals of the project, of the socialist project, facing the everyday struggles in the country. The other figure that Shikunyaku disposed, it was himself being the enemy of Mozambican cultural values. Um, the, the struggle, as I said, for cultural affirmation of diversity of the country, a country that had to establish Portuguese as its official language, not national language. We have a difference. We, sp 
we are countries of the, the five uh, Africa, now six with the Equatorial Guinea, we use Portuguese as official language, not as the national language. National language is in Brazil and Portugal, so we have here a different uh, platform. The struggle for, as I said, for cult cultural recognition of the diversity that made up Mozambique was one of the key objectives of the, the revolutionary struggle. And although various elements of traditional culture were seen as obscurantists and identified with remnants of traditional world, uh, the exaltation of authentic culture expressed in dances and languages and the national heroes was one of the bets of the new Mozambican state. And thus for Chikunyoka, on the opposite way, the European culture remain the example of cultural acculturation. So on the left, you say culture. How come this is culture? These are wild dances and the true culture is European culture, nothing all. So it's the reaffirmation that colonial ideology had penetrated very deeply in the minds of many of Mozambicans as other author Kane, Gungi Wationg have underlined. At the same time, we have the problem that is, that's why I put the, the two other pictures, um, what mean in New Mozambique, the question of what is an authentic culture. And in that sense, taken to extreme, non-authentic cultural interventions were viewed with suspicion. Uh, and if you see quite often, Shikunyok uh, as a belt says love, it is the symbol of peace. So we are talking about 70s. And uh, this sort of free liberal images that were predominant symbols of liberation in the West were in Mozambique perceived as symbols, a reenactment of European colonialism and as identified with the figure of the enemy. And as, as a consequence, several young people, several friends of mine were accused of behaving inappropriately uh, of challenging the revolutionary process for having assimilated bourgeois elements, disregarding their roots, and were sent to re-education, to re-education camps, something I don't want to, well, we can talk about it later, but it will be another topic. And finally, uh, Shikunyoka, the saboteur of the economy. Uh, the country was in a big turmoil, many of the Portuguese had left, and the, there was all these attempts to destroy the structures of the economy uh, that, as you'll see in, this, in these three images. The economic goals of Mozambican government aim to challenge the structural dependence vis-a-vis -vis South Africa and Rhodesia, and to expand the internationalist framework. And that brought a lot of problems with Rhodesia in South Africa. Uh, and in, as a result, we witnesses, it, if you will read the newspapers, lots of acts of economic sabotage, small or large, that put at risk the reproduction of revolutionary conditions. And these questions were publicly addressed, as I said, in newspapers and uh, in large meetings and so on. So the newspapers would denounce situations of speculation of basic food products, for example, as you have on the right, and this enunciation of Shikunyok as someone who refuses to work and refuses to collaborate in the production, a key condition to the construction of the new man. So laziness, the spirit of letting go, the neglect of public things, were actions classified as acts of sabotage and became target of judicial actions. But at the same time, if we do address this question inside the factories of the public institutions, you could uh, be seen uh, with suspicion because of your criticism. So I'm just saying that there were two sides to these questions and these were questions complicated to address. So my objective as here was to underline the importance of Shikunyoka as an expression of denunciation, the social ills that the revolution was supposed to overcome. And more than that, the conviction that graphic humor, the case of the cartoons, are important communicative strategies for obtaining more diverse political and ideological objectives in our context of the global South. The historical difference offers now the opportunity to understand the global South as a political phenomenon with different problems, dynamics, and legacies. 
And although we describe the decolonization of the 20th century as a historical specific episode, the political problems of decolonization continue to haunt the regimes of today because colonialism is an epistemic and ontological project and the political project continues. And the central dynamic of contemporary political thought is this difficult transition from a mo moment of opposition to the colonial capitalist system to the articulation of alternative projects that the Mozambican revolution is a good example. And just to finalize the global south, in the words of Nyerere, it's about engaging with relations between power, discourse, and political institutions and practices. It is the recognition of the ways in which power and therefore resistance are imbricated in social relations in everyday life. Power is not monolithic and not unidirectional, but imbuing relations within society, between state and society, and present in everyday aspect of life. This power is not power over, but also the power of resistance and opposition, the power for self-representation. And that's why I think that revolution as self-affirmation has to be improved if we carefully, carefully analyze the contemporary history of the last, the second half of 20th century to understand the independent struggles and movements in the global south. In the case of Mozambique, that was the one I, I presented you, I think we have to understand the political projects that were at the core of the Mozambican revolution. And after all, the struggle for culture, including the struggle for the political cultures present and to overstep the, the legacies of colonialism was one of the strongest demands of the revolution. And I think uh, if you read carefully and understand carefully contemporary Mozambican context, lots of these projects were, some of these projects were achieved and that's why Chikunyoka is a figure of the past, but a past that reminds us that some of those objectives were not achieved, namely uh, a non-liberal economy, the emancipation of women, but we can talk about it later. And I thank you very much for your attention and for the five more minutes I took. Thank you. Now I take off my sound. Thank you very much, Maria Paula for this extensive uh, presentation. You managed to talk about so many topics and I have so many questions now. Uh, <laughs> was on, on yeah, imperialism, the post-colonial um, time period, the colonial struggles, um, the Luciferum world, comics. So thank you very much. But before I start with my questions, I would like to give the audience the opportunity to ask questions and just again, the technical um, way of doing that would be that you type in the word question or your name or anything in the chat so that we know that uh, you have a question and then you can ask your questions um, by activating your camera and your microphone. And I'm sure there will be many questions. Ah, yes, me. Um, thank you so much, Maria Paula. Muito obrigada for this very insightful and rich and um, really, really inspiring presentation. I, I will definitely have to read your article, and I'm, I'm grateful to Yannick that you already shared it in, in the discussion. Um, I, I, I found it very um, important that you stressed so much the importance of the image in the production or reproduction and recreation of history and histories. And um, I was wondering if you could comment maybe on the function of um, comics as visual archives, maybe in, in general on the importance of visual archives, on the creation of visual archives and the role of visually self-archiving one's own history. Um, and you already talked about um, humor and the subversive potential of caricatures and cartoons um, as cognitive strategies. Um, as a form of resistance, uh, so I, I found it very interesting to, to also see visually archived um, the, the enemy and, and, in that sense. And I, I was wondering if you could comment further on this archival function on, of cartoons and comics. Can I ask? Uh, thank you very much for your 
very interesting question. There is a, um, a, a whole set of academics uh, in dealing with history in the sub-Saharan Africa, that those, that's more my, my context, have been calling the attention that we can't just write history with written documents, because written documents is a part of the archive, not the whole archive. So we need to bring in other elements. And this always poses the questions about the sort of differentiation between what we talk that is history, that is almost a social science, and then we have arts, and then we have the other things that we don't know very well what they are about. Why am I talking about this? Uh, the National Archives of Mozambique have a huge archive of oral, in, of oral interviews, speeches, discourses, and so on, because the oral is part of our life. So we can't have an archive if we can't get that sort of information. What is interesting about those, uh, that archive is that the oral sources started coming into the archives in colonial times. So it was the, the first director of the Archives of Mozambique that understood the importance of understanding, for instance, the Gaza Empire, and that is empire that fell to the Portuguese in 1895, uh, through the voices of the last uh, warriors that were still alive. So in the late 60s, they started a campaign to grasp their opinions. They are very critical of Portuguese colonialism, but you still have the, it's like a time capsule. You are listening to them and you're like, oh my God, I'm listening to someone that is gone almost 60 or 70 years ago, but the memory is there. So that is one of the function of the archive is to open up, to embody the memory that can substantiate our roots and our, as we say in Mozambique, is from our roots that we anticipate the future. So it's always this balance that we have. At the same time, if you pay closely attention to uh, the wall paintings, for instance, you know, in, in Yasa, around the, wall, the, the, the houses, you have paintings that are the story of the family, quite often in a very cynical and caricatural way, which is very interesting. So you go and visit someone, you go around the house and you know a little bit already what is going on, why this family has problems and so on. The same thing, even when you, you wrap yourself around the kanga, like that piece of cloth, and quite often there are sayings there that you have to pay attention because there is a message there. Or there are figures that we use to express a political message. So what I'm trying to say, it's in line with your question of the visual archives, is that it doesn't make any sense, in my opinion, to separate the visual from the written, from the oral. All of them are our memories. The problem of the written, it has a standardized bureaucratic form. Now I go back to Chiknyoka. That is a certain form, and Anne Laura Stoller and Valentin Mudimbe have talked a lot about it. The archive as a form, as an, inst an instrument and form of power. And that is something that we have to address very seriously because not that I'm against those archives, they are very useful, but they're, they are part of the history, they are not the whole history. And that's why I have so many problems with people not addressing uh, history with oral sources, uh, art sources. For instance, if you look at uh, the, the debates that are going on now with France and UK to return the stolen pieces, it's not just art, it's history, because lots of those objects uh, represent history that we want to, be, to get them back. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to see how history unveils and how after all these years and probably also because of the internet, we came to acknowledge that written is not the only form of uh, keeping information and constructing, selecting information to be reproduced for the future. So we have quite often, if you look in comics, there are always these hints of humor that are very precise of that time and space that later on when you are writing, you just draw those very universalistic approaches and you lose sight. So I'm in line with you, thank you. I don't know if I answer your question, but that's how I tackle archives. We have another question from Luzala. Yes, yes, that's, uh, that's me. Uh, wait, uh, your... Okay, can, can see 
me now. Uh, I also uh, want to uh, thank Ms. Minister for her uh, um, for her insight and uh, for the very uh, powerful presentation. Uh, and uh, I actually I have like like two questions, but uh, uh, well, the the first one is like uh, more important uh, to me. Um, and uh, I would like to know uh, whether uh, Ms. Vanessa, whether you can uh, say something about um, the um, the public perception of um, uh, of this uh, political comic, uh, like how it was uh, perceived, uh, like uh, in in the sixties and seventies when uh, Mozambique was in uh, political turmoil and in political uh, in political change. Um, and uh, whether uh, uh, this this perception of uh, of political uh, comics uh, in the public uh, is still like the same now, or whether uh, it has changed uh, in modern times, and uh, maybe what its uh, status is. Oh, and the second question is um, more or less related to that: Is uh, Shikonyoka? Uh, does he still remain? Is he still like um, uh, a public enemy? Is he still? Uh, does he still have this uh, enemy status, or uh, also have this um, kind of uh, pictures uh, changed in in modern Mozambique uh, country, Mozambique state? Thank you. Uh, let me start from the last one. Uh, Shikunyaka was a figure that embodied the symbol of the revolution. Uh, we have a kind of a strange story. We have Frelimo that moved from being a revolutionary socialist party into a neoliberal party now. So they write left and they act right. Uh, as many, most of the African parties in power, I don't think we differentiate very much in that sense. Uh, so obviously in the late 80s, early 90s, when the shift started towards uh, liberal economy, uh, the Shikunyaka figure, that was a figure against all the evils that were in the way of constructing the new man, the new woman, the, empowered men started being left out so colonialism class race ethnic questions started being put aside and what emerged is the son of shikunyoka so because shikunyoka died because he was getting old we also get old figures get old it's not like mafalda uh, and so emerged the son of shikunyoka i'm sorry i don't have any image of the of his son because my material, some of them are in Maputo, I have my life split. So I promise if you want, I can send you some pictures of the son. It's not as pretty as the father, I would say, but sometimes there, there is the son there. But at the same time, if that idea about Shikunyaka in the 70s was very strong, and I'm telling you, if you ask anyone who is older than, 30 is 30 years old or older something about you are being a shikunyaka you will understand immediately what you are talking about so you are playing a reactionary role somehow and it, it was very important so it became part of our jargon however even now there is one of the mozambican newspapers called savannah it's a weekly newspaper it has a, um, a section at the end called shikonyokis the things of the Shikunyok. So suddenly it's like a young generation, the connotations are different, but it's what is, an, it's defrauding the state. This is a private newspaper, but it's an open newspaper. And there is another thing, it's interesting, on and off it will emerge. Uh, in the city, so, uh, above all in Maputo, in, in different contexts, you'll see uh, wall paintings saying, the Shikunyok of the week is, so someone is denouncing someone, so do a wall painting and say the Shikunyok of the, there is no drawing, it's just the name. So if someone will say, I am the Shikunyok of the week, I did something very wrong. Well, I'm not going to do because I'm not a politician. But anyway, if I become a politician, it's high risk that 
for some reason they'll become she kunyo. And sometimes on Facebook, you'll find the contest to identify who is the she of the week. So that idea of the symbol, someone that embodies the evils of that moment. I think it's you, Peter, who wanted to ask a question, right? Or not me. <laughs> I have a question, Peter has a question as well. I, I saw um, you want to start, Peter? Otherwise, I can start as well. Maybe I just, because my question connects to the two questions from Yasmin and from Lusada. You talk about the Shikonyoka of the week, was there a misbehavement, a behavior, right? Something did something really wrong. Was there Shikonyoka connected to COVID-19? Like, uh, did they use the figure to say you behaved wrong in the pandemic? Um, yeah, because, um, I think it's interesting with, with Shikonyoka because he said as well, comics are very precise with the historical details for sure. But I think um, in comic studies, we always say the, the way of figuration that you can um, identify with a figure, the less precise this figure is drawn. Like, um, the more realistic, the less you identify. But Shikonyoka is quite quite simple in, in the way he's drawn so that you can identify very easily. And that's interesting because he's he's not a hero, he's an anti-hero maybe or a bad person. And um, yeah, so everybody could be Shikonyoka. And in this way, it's really general, I think, and, and transferable to nowadays as well and to modern problems like the way how to behave during the pandemic. Um, I'll be very brief. As far as I, Shikunyak, when we are talking about uh, the Shikunyak of the week and so on, it's just the name. We don't have, no longer have the drawing. It's just, you are the embodiment of that behavior. So we, we lost the figure. We just re retained the name. Uh, regarding COVID, I have no idea. I think we lost the Paula. Ah, Ma Maria Paula, we can't hear you. <laughs> it always cuts this. I have it automatic to cut the sound. Uh, this, I'm sorry. The second question, the second element of your question is the question of anti heroes. And that is something very interesting in Mozambique. You always have heroes and anti heroes going side and by side. If you want, I can, I have it somewhere. I wrote a piece three or four years ago about the reference, the heroes in the, the national music, how the music was important to create. And this goes again. Uh, to Jasmine, how important is music to create uh, in people that don't know how to read Portuguese, and most of them don't read Portuguese, to create these figures to be the embodiment of what the revolution wants to be. And so people will also sing very well the goals of the revolutionary struggle. So if 
if you read the, the documentation from Frelimo, it's very elaborate. I don't think uh, more than 100 people would understand the political goals of most of those documents. But if you listen to the music, which are sung in Shimakonde, Kiswahili, uh, Shishangan, and so on, we'll understand we are going, we are fighting about against the Portuguese, we are fighting for our liberation, we are fighting for our land. So there is all a narrative that is very important there and also the identification of the anti-heroes. So I could, I'm not going to sing because I sing very badly, but the figure like Joana Simeão, um, Cavandam, Gwenger were part of this repertoire of identifying that their behavior was bad behavior. They had betrayed, they had done sin, they had done so and so. If you want, I can share the paper, it's published in a book, but because I, I believe in, uh, I'll send it to Yannick and then he'll share it to you because I don't have the link but I, I can share it. So it's interesting to understand that in that sense, you have always the two moments going hand in hand, the hero and anti-hero. So, but regarding uh, the COVID, I'll ask, although the question of disease is always a problem because it mixes the scientific knowledge with the other interpretation of the disease. I happen to be already in the middle of two uh, big pandemics, uh, the HIV, which was really the big experience of my youth, but uh, I, I, it happened in Maputo and in Ampula when I was doing research to have cases of um, cholera. And it's really complicated to address the question, so it's not clear who brought it. Just to give you an example, we were, uh, I, you probably know him, Mia Koto, uh, he's a writer, but Mia Kot is also a biologist. So we were in Ampula doing research uh, in the island of Mozambique, and we started addressing the question that people had to boil water because there was an outburst of cholera. Uh, I think we, at that time, we didn't behave well. So we were two weeks in advance saying like, okay, if you don't boil the water, you are going to die because there is an epidemic coming. So you were called the angels of disaster. So we, we were really perceived as someone badly. And the, I had left already, but uh, uh, Mia Kote and other colleagues were accused of being uh, blood suckers because they were trying to get uh, the blood samples to identify cholera and people were really afraid of what they were doing. And this is something that happens routinely when there are big epidemics and you don't explain what is going on, but in, in broad terms so that people don't understand where you come from and how to dialogue. So that's why I'm saying it's very important to dialogue with community leaders and so on, which is a figure that has developed across times. But it's just to explain that, to explain a disease is never an, an easy task. And I think, as far as I understand, it has been very important how people behave because they understood the dimension of the problem based on previous experiences. So I think the bad behaviors are upper mid class that don't care about it. But that's my personal explanation. And another thing for Yasmin, uh, if now it's very difficult to see because the, most of them are gone. But in Mozambique, it was quite common to have wall paintings. And I think the inspiration was Mexico depicting episodes of the struggle. If you go to right when you leave the, the airport, the Mavalan airport in Maputo, you cross uh, the square of the heroes. And there is a wall uh, painting with the, main, the key revolutionary episodes. I, I, I had that image to share with you, but there were so many images. I decided not to go. But that was something normal to have wall paintings announcing um, historical episodes to remember what, where did we came from. So that is something that is also preserved now. So that is a, a collective work. But I can send you the image if you want. I can, I can use the favor of Yannick to send the images. It's going to be the postino. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We, we have two other questions. The first one is from Peter and then Ceci. 
Thank you so much for the really inspiring talk and um, all the connections between history and also visual culture you made. Um, and I have a question because, of course, you've mentioned that as well, that there is a high amount of illiteracy, of course, uh, in Mozambique. And, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the figure of, um, of Shinyorka um, is very visual, but then on the other hand, it's based also on written culture um, because of the comments. Some of, I mean, of course, he's very... Um, easy to identify and also the evils that are kind of connected uh, to uh, let's say colonialism or imperialism are quite visually constructed but then on the other hand some of the examples you've shown you really need to read the text to really understand um, what it's uh, gaining at and so I was really wondering because apparently it it, it entered into the of uh, national imaginary, it seems, even having like a continuation of his son and all that. But I wonder how people who are not able to read and who would not also, for example, read newspapers in general, how they would be connecting to that figure if that was across some other forms of circulation as well. So what, I'm, my, my, what my question is really aiming at is how did the circulation work and was some kind of orality involved or was some kind of copying the figure. It seems like the figure was so popular that it might have, and this is just an, uh, just an hypothesis, if it maybe was being transformed into public space in terms of what you just mentioned, in terms of wall uh, paintings and the like. So that would be my question. Thank you, Peter, very much. Two comments. Yes, indeed, uh, illiteracy was is still very high. I think we have forty-five percent of the country who can't write. Uh, and when we attain, we obtain independence, only five percent of the people would speak Portuguese, first and second language. Now we are about fifty, fifty-five percent. So it's the independence that brought the Portuguese as the language of communication. So it's the function of the state, which is a complicated topic to address, and I'm not very sure. This is, for me, one of the complicated elements was that the Chikunyaka was in Portuguese and not in local languages. And many people, mainly in the South, would write because of the work of the Protestant missionary work, they would know how to write in their own language, in Shishangan, Shironga, Shitsu, and so on. So I, I'm not aware of public images of Shikunyaka with uh, local, with national languages besides Portuguese. So that is one of the incongruences of this image, is the centrality of Portuguese. I know that the goal was to create an idea of Mozambique alpha through language, but in my opinion, that's my criticism. It was, it, we overdid it, and I, I take the, the criticism, because we didn't create a space for the other languages to also to coexist. And this had been, throughout the liberation struggle, one of the promises of Frelim that you recognize the cultural diversity, it didn't work. So that is one of, one of the problems that has to be addressed. The second, and I didn't speak very well about it, although Shikunyoka has two ways of dressing. One is in a suit and so on. The one is in shorts and um, in a t-shirt. Uh, that sounds more like rural light, but no, these are your urban figures. They are the urban from the middle class and they are the urban from the periphery, but they are urban figures. There are very little figures of Chikunyoka as a peasant. So this was addressed mainly to the urban center. And I think that's my interpretation. All of them died already, the, the people that did the drawings. I, 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 my father was friends with one of them. That's why I started doing the research. And uh, when I asked him, so where did you get the inspiration? I knew about Chipnyaka, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the question was that they only knew about the urban context. 
they were not aware of what was the reality in the, in the countryside. So they could not address those questions. So where, what do you, you have about the countryside? You have the questions of exploitation of women. Uh, we have the questions of aggression by Rhodesia and South Africa, but that's it. So the questions of the peasant question is not there in a country that at that time was and still is um, mostly rural and not urban. But the enemy was the enemy at the core of the city. And it also has some roots in the idea that Frelim would look. Frelim is mainly um, rural uh, background, people coming from rural context, rural setting. And it was very um, and trustful towards people living in urban context. So there was a, a big problem with living in urban context. So all the, the enemies of the revolution were the enemies present in urban context. I'm finishing a paper about it. So if you want to, to have a look at it, I can share with you. But the problem is the urban context, the prostitution, the drunkness, the drug dealers, the culture, it's always the urban context. So that is the, the big problem. So I think we have to address that question. Finally, the circulation and the times of circulation. The culture became part of, uh, of a certain repertoire of conceptions that are more than visual. Now, I think if you put to someone who is 20 years old, a an image of Chikunyok is not going to know that this is the Chikunyok. But if you talk about the word, you are now Shikonyo Kando, is going to say, oh no, I'm not really, I'm behaving. So it, it, it outlived the, the goal of the figure that was very limited in time and space, but it created a shared space of enunciation of what we are against at a certain time. So it's a sort of localism that expresses an historical past that continues. So we continue with the figure of the enemy. Uh, there were other enemies, so in terms of the war, we would call Badids Armados, BAs, those are gone, but Chikunyaka stayed. So that, that is the interest. It became part of the oral culture. Not much, I would say, the, the written, because the written now, the, the drawings, uh, we are into other, other figures. The sun, I think very soon we are going to have the grand sun because we reproduce very quickly. But no, but the wording is there. I don't know if I answer your question. Absolutely. Thank you very much for clarifying all this. Ceci, you have a question as well? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Paula, for the talk. Very interesting that we eat open many questions and connections and maybe my question is uh, connected with the question that uh, Lusala did about the contemporary place of Shikunyoka uh, and the statements and the figures that uh, he represented and represents and you talk um, um, about Mafalda in a moment and I remember that uh, Mafalda she's anti-imperialist, but she's a big fan of the Beatles, for example. And in what you were um, talking about Shikunyoka, uh, the scene of the role of the um, cosmopolitan or global or bourgeois culture was more a game of oppositions. And my question is if today there is a reconfiguration in the mass culture about the question of the national culture that if it's uh, less a game of opposites and it became more complex and maybe as a uh, reconfiguration of the external influences. I think you a very tricky question to answer, Celia. It's not easy, um, but let me start from the beginning. In 1974, um, in, a, in January 1974, about 300 Portuguese arrived in Mozambique to be colonists. I'm talking about January 1974. Three months later, there was a coup d'etat. So no one anticipated that colonialism was going to end. And this flow of 
Portuguese people to Mozambique in, in a sense to avoid being jobless because it was a problem of finding jobs. Uh, this was a, con a constant and no one would anticipate. We knew that the things were not okay, but no one could predict when it was going to end. And in that sense, one has, that is a, a problem to provocate Peter and Yannick what in Europe people call the revolution of Carnation Revolution, that is a, an European problem. Uh, the question of uh, the coup d'etat is never addressed because in terms of cultural strategies, an European democracy can, is not supposed to start with a coup d'etat. So you very quickly remove the coup d'etat, like the coup d'etat in Greece, the coup d'etat in Portugal, and you say, there was a democratic revolution, but you say like, why are military in the picture? What are they doing? It's okay to have military doing the revolution in Latin America and Africa, in Europe, no, it's not okay. So that is the first element that we have to redress when you are trying to address what is the construction of a, nat a national culture, that what are the cultures involved? So that is the first element. The second element, to go back to Mafalda. Mafalda was part of my imaginary because of my parents, but still uh, in between 75 and 77, 25, 250,000 Portuguese left Mozambique. They were mostly the middle career people in the state. Teachers, professors, doctors, lawyers, they left because they were Portuguese, they were not going to say that is a big difference vis-a-vis -vis what happened in Latin America. In Latin America and South Africa, they remained. In most of African countries, uh, when we have settler colonies, being it Algeria, Kenya, uh, Angola, Mozambique, uh, Senegal, they leave because they are afraid. They were there to rule. Once they are gone, they don't want to stay. So there is a problem with the natural, nat with the national culture, what are the cores of the natural culture, the national culture? One of the things that was important in Mozambique to explain why Mafalda is very much present in different contexts is that the Portuguese left and thanks God and with many breath. There, there had been a coup d'etat in Chile and in Argentina and in Brazil. So the people that could not get, that had the political oppositioners that left Chile and left Argentina and left Brazil came to Mozambique to help. And with them came another cultural references and came, that also became part of our cultural references because they were internationalist people. So in solidarity, uh, there are some work now being written about them, but without acknowledging the contribution of, especially of people from Chile, uh, the Allende government, uh, we had the minister of Allende and so on, supporting very, lots of people from Allende actually, from Chile. A and it in a sense created a notion of the importance of international understanding of musics, of songs, of dances and so on. And this was a clash inside the schools and context where you would circulate, we were young, and this idea of trying to create the national culture based on our roots. So there was always this very opposite forces of trying to connect us to the outside world, but at the same time trying to impose the roots of Mozambican culture. And this was done through festivals that still go on of National Festival of Culture, National Books. Um, a, a very interesting attempt was the, the translation of key authors. That's, that's when I, I got to get in touch with Shinwa Shebe, Wol Shuinka, and so on. They got to be translated. So we would know what literature is about, the films. So you would see lots of films about the Chile and about Cuba and same time lots of film by Osman Semben. So it was always this in, outside and inside. And that is the way we grew up to understand that we had roots in Mozambique, but we would belong to a broader world. That was the privilege of my generation. It was a privilege. It was schizophrenic, but it was a privilege. And I think that was the way we managed to understand that if for a time, uh, the revolution had been successful in changing the nature of power. 
the struggle would continue in Brazil, in Chile, in Palestine, in Palestine, in Western Sahara. So that the things we had to support uh, the continuation of the project, and that was also part of our natural na national culture and national duty to support. I didn't show but because I have tons of chikunyokas, but there is a, a, a cartoon of chikunyoka. Uh, the government, I think in 1979, created a tax called Solidarity Tax. It was uh, medical, it was nothing basically. But that tax was supposed to support the internationalist struggle, to support Eastern Timor, uh, the internationalist workers in Mozambique. So it was a, a token of solidarity. I don't, I don't know for how long it existed, but I remember when I went back to Mozambique, still that tax was in my paychecks. So it was an official tax. And she could not be saying, I'm not going to pay that tax. I'm not going to support those leftists. I don't understand what those socialism they want to build. So those were things that will grasp that were important for the revolutionary transition. Now I think we are pretty much part of the westernized global culture of hip hop and so on. Not that it doesn't have local elements very interesting like a Zagaya, Adama Dubling and so on, but we kind of lost that tension of what we produce and how we dialogue with the broader world. So maybe it's just my age criticism. I don't know if I answer your question, but. Are there any other questions? We are running out of time a little bit, but so I think we have time for one last question. I have two promises to fulfill, the text and image. And I think I have an image of Shikunyoka in a wall painted somewhere, because I managed to, because some of my photographs are in photographs that I don't have time to digitalize because they were from old times. But I try to see where it is and I promise to send because there were wall paintings of Shikunyoka everywhere. I promise to send to, to you and then you'll do it. No, I forward it. Yes, that would be great. I have one last question, if you allow. Um, you talked about the problematic uh, label of the Luciferian world and all the other cultures and languages which exist in Mozambique and Angola and the other uh, country, African countries. And um, I think it's the question of, of how to gain an audience. If you do, if you produce a cartoon in Portuguese, there is one particular audience. If you produce it in a local language, you have another audience. And I just wanted to ask you what could be strategies to um, combine this? Because I thought when you when you talked about it, I thought about uh, newspaper cartoons of Sergio Simba. And mm -hmm. he usually he uses local languages and then he uses subtitles in Portuguese, mm -hmm. which is really interesting because then you really have the two audiences together. And that's really nice. That's one stra strategy maybe to yeah. Yeah, to, to um, I don't know, to raise consciousness about the situation, the language situation, the linguistic situation in Mozambique. Um, uh, it, it, the sound is off again. Always, I always forget to activate. I think we have a problem because Lusophone, it's not really a question of language, it's the imaginary that's behind. And the question, as I said earlier on, is that we don't, we were the ones that promoted Portuguese as a language of the country. So in that sense, we are constructing another variant of Portuguese. Uh, if I'm, the Portuguese I was talking with you and Peter is my Portuguese por Portuguese, but I have my Mozambican Portuguese, which is another one. And sometimes I'm talking, it happens already in the past, uh, that I will take people to the field, we are doing research and suddenly the guy looks at me and say, can you translate in the same? But I'm talking Portuguese. So I'm clueless about what you are talking about because the quantity of local expressions that we use, uh, it's another variable. And, and I think that when you are in academic audiences, we all share the same Portuguese, a septic version. 
because that's the stand, academic standards. But if, if I'm discussing colloquially with other people, then we'll go into local languages and local expressions and we'll go into another direction, which is more complicated. Uh, and in that sense, my question is, why don't we ever use in Europe, when I'm talking about the problem of Portugal, to say like in Europe, because Portugal is not representative of Europe, nor is Italy or Denmark or Germany for that sake. Why do we insist that five countries have something in common? Because if you are going to have something in common, then Portugal was colonized by the Roman Empire, uh, and then we'll join them together. Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, oh, those Romans. It doesn't make any sense. So it's a claim to reclaim our, our trajectories and to move out. I think I finally understood, and I hope there is no one from Brazil in the audience. Um, okay, I think we have a big difference with Brazil is that as the Senghor would say, we kept the language and we kept the culture. Uh, the, colon the colonial, modern colonial presence is very recent. It's the second half of 19th century. So they had exterminated already everybody in Latin America when the project started in Africa. And they didn't manage to exterminate everybody, nor the cultures. So the big question is that the knowledge were kept and the language were kept and they became an artifact of protest and resistance. Quite often, I can also share with you some of the old newspapers of 1920, 1930, that were before the coup d'etat, the uh, Estado Novo in Portugal, 1926, and you'll have uh, the newspaper in two languages, uh, in um, the Africano, uh, in Portuguese and Xixangan. And it was official. It's the Estado Novo that imposes Portuguese as the language to circulate. As a result, half of the time, the Portuguese didn't know that were being mocked by the locals because all of them have nicknames, uh, have stories about them. Uh, even if you see the Maconda dances in Mapico, they have the, uh, the, the faces of the Portuguese and they're making fun of them. So there are always these small spaces of open resistance and challenging colonialism in the sense that it reminds us that if you really want to understand what was resistance we have to go broader than just analyzing the liberation struggle because these moments were everywhere and that's why i'm i'm a little bit upset if we if we focus too much in portuguese which is the problem of brazil because brazil lost the strength of the national languages so Brazil insists, it, the problem is not really with, only with Portugal, it's Portugal and Brazil that don't want to recognize that we speak other languages and that's part of our reality. If you go to Guinea-Bissau or to Cape Verde, Creole is the dominant language. Nobody would talk to you. It's an effort. Whenever I have to talk to colleagues, they have to make an effort to talk to me in Portuguese because on every day at school, uh, and university, most of them already speak in Creole. So that is a big challenge in the language landscape that we have to address. And second, you have the big question of the Kiswahili. Kiswahili is spreading. Uh, we have Lingala now, it's a variant now already present in Angola. And it just became one of the potential official languages of South Africa. So things are moving into other directions. Probably we don't pay very much attention to it. Uh, as the Afrikaner is another language that it's becoming more and more endogenized, it's not just the language. The, the corruptel of the, the Dutch, it's another language. So I think we need to pay more attention from the perspective of this context and a little bit less from what outside the world wants. But I agree with you. We need to use two and three languages. And when Serge Pissarra writes, draws those, uses the two languages, it's a, um, a trend in Mozambique, not just in, com in uh, cartoons, but you have it a lot in um, uh, children's books. I buy a lot from my grandson. We have the whole collection. But there is this whole collection of author writing. And the books are always in two languages. 
even books written by people. I think one of them is either from Venezuela or from Peru that remained in Mozambique. They already write the stories about their countries. I think it's from Peru, but it's translated in a national language. So it's a, a story that comes from another context, from the Amazonian to Mozambique to explain it's an environmental protection narrative, but it's being translated into a an, an, uh, local language. So this is my sense of cosmopolitan, belonging to a broader world and we contribute to it with the national languages. And that's a way of protecting the language too, because if we just impose, I, I can circulate in French, in English, in Russian, a little bit in Kiswahili, but I miss the local languages, which are ways of opening doors and moving. I don't know how much, but whenever I go to a country and I start talking to people, I never met anyone who just speak two languages, speak three or four. We don't speak very well, but we manage to survive. And that is the flexibility of talking multiple languages. So I think we need to start having, in the written form, to have all this these things. But if I, I don't have any book right now here with me because uh, I sometimes when I come back from Mozambique, I bring those books with me because I think it's a, it's not just that the stories are local, it's just they are written in two languages. So my grandson has this whole collection. I think now he's moving out of these books he's into something more adult, but still he has the books and I promise next time I go home to make some photocopies and share with you because it's it's a way of addressing through comics. Why is it important? The comics that I was showing, uh, I have some Kurika because it was a trend for a long time. My youth was Kuri, Kurika Komanima. It was the thing that everybody will like the people selling the newspaper, Kurika Komanima. So we'll go running to buy the newspaper on Saturday. So. That was, it's very difficult now to find it. It's very expensive to buy the whole collection. But it's a wonderful piece to understand because it's plenty of international discussions of, of struggles with local comics. So it's always, as I was saying, this tension between the local, trying to be part of the global and the global being introduced, that I find it was something that shaped my imagination. And I think it's something that keeps shaping the way I think about the world. But I don't know if I answer your question. I just went into very different directions. I'm sorry. I'm someone from the oral culture that we go around instead of going precisely to the question. I'm sorry. You don't have to. That was really, really nice and inspiring. And um, I think we all learned a lot. Um, about and, and gain an insight in the Mozambican uh, reality and the issues connected with them. So thank you very much. It's really great. You, to all of you for the questions, for the invitation. It was really nice to be here. Oi, it's again. No, it's working. Uh, and in case you need anything, let me know because my, my, my address is, on, is online if you need anything. But I promise to send the three texts, the, the text and the two pictures, I, I promise. Um, and if you find someone from Mozambique, they could talk about Psikalakedan. Psikalakedan, it's um, a way of doing woodwork, but it's a way of, it's like a comic in woodwork. And I think that would be very interesting. There, is, there was an exposition last year at the Franco Mozambique, and I can't write you the name, but it's something that I also grew up with, looking at those pieces, and I can share some of them with you, just to see that we need to move a little bit away from the paper and the drawing, because uh, comics can be everywhere. And I, I bought one that is in my office. I'm, uh, wait, I think I have one. Wait, wait, one minute. Yes, I have one minute. It's broken, but it's for you to see. So this is a lawyer. Let me see if you can see this. We I'm destroying this. This is a lawyer. So it's written court, and the lawyer has a, a computer and everything. So that's what I was trying to explain. That this is urban culture. That you can't explain to anyone 
what is a, a court. You, but we have lots of things like that being produced in the country to explain uh, uh, how people work, uh, conflicts, and so on. So that's called psychological. There's a, a specific name because of the wood. But I think it would be interesting. This, that was my, 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 the thing I bought to explain how people interpret the figure of the lawyer and the court, because it's not what I think a court is about, but it's forms of grasping, of popular grasping and interpretation. And there's actually it's written court, but sometimes you don't need the, the name. Sometimes you look at uh, the, the, the set and you understand what they are, the criticism they have in there. So it's, it's quite interesting. Okay, I, I'll try. To, I'm not sure if I'm going to write it. See, I think it's like that. But if, uh, but I'm, 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 I'm sending it to you for you to to see that there are other ways of expressing criticism, analyzing reality that sometimes we don't pay attention, but they are everywhere. But thank you very much for your question, for putting me to think. And I hope sometimes in the future, maybe we'll see each other physically, face to face. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you again for the questions and being with us today. And thanks for that, Paula. Have a nice thank evening, you. have a nice afternoon. Obrigada. Bye-bye. Bye. Obrigada, tchau. Obrigada, tchau. Foi ótimo, maravilhosa. Obrigada. Obrigada, muito obrigada.